Hello and welcome to episode 146 of Page One, the Writer's Podcast. I'm Marco. I'm Tarek. And uh, thanks for joining us after our short festive hiatus. I hope you all had a good Christmas and New Year. Um, and we're back with some brilliant guests for you in the next few weeks. Starting off with someone who made big waves with his debut novel, A Fatal Crossing. Yeah, that's right. This week we're going to be chatting with Tom Hindle who um, has a kind of interesting route into writing, as so many authors do. Um, PR background, uh, started writing when he was in high school, very much a kind of locked room mystery fan, and A Fatal Crossing, his debut novel, was very much that kind of genre, um, and his upcoming book, uh, The Murder Game, which is out uh, ne February. next month, yeah, February yeah. 2023, uh -huh. um, is again that kind of Agatha Christie, Anthony Horowitz-inspired work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it, it was interesting speaking to him because he, although he's writing these sort of murder mysteries, locked room mysteries, he says he didn't really start reading Agatha Christie until quite recently. Mm -hmm. And it was really Anthony Horowitz, I think, that, that got him into that genre. Yeah. Uh, he also makes me feel very, very old because he talks about <laughs> writing Harry Potter stories as a kid. Um, <laughs> So uh, yeah, as opposed to reading them to your kids, Mark. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, uh, many reasons to hate Tom. No, just joking. Uh, no, it, it's a really uh, fun and interesting chat. He's a really engaging guy, and yeah. also really interesting how he found his agent as well. Um, yeah, another unusual um, yep. route into that avenue. Yeah, definitely. So. We'll get straight into it after a quick advert for our writer's notebook and then we'll be back at the end of the podcast with a bit more chat and to let you know about next week's guest. And the end chat will also include some spoilers for Netflix's Glass Onion. So that's just a pre-warning. We'll warn you again oh, at the end. I'm going to go watch it now quickly before we record that then. The blank page. To some, it's terrifying, an obstacle to overcome. But we prefer to think of it as an opportunity, a blank canvas to be filled with all of the adventures and characters in our head. So how to overcome that fear? Well, we all know the best advice for a writer is, write. Seriously, get words on the page and more will follow. But what about later, when you start trying to pull those threads of what you've written together? What about the character you wrote about way back at the start? Who was she again? What was she carrying? And where did she leave the MacGuffin that she now really needs in the third act? Think about all those top thrillers you like to read. Or that amazing drama you just watched. What did they all have in common? Structure and planning. As aspiring writers ourselves, we've tried many different methods to try and organise all the thoughts about the stories we want to tell. We've been there searching for a piece of scrap paper to note something down, or making a quick note on our phone in between meetings. Or sometimes we'll make a note in whatever notebook we're carrying or a document on our laptop so we don't forget that great idea. Let's be honest, it can all be a bit messy and it's easy to lose track of everything. And that's when we realise it's not just a story that needs structure and planning, but the way we gather all of our thoughts about it as well. And so we made Page One. Page One is more than just another notebook. It's a place to put down all your ideas for your latest project divided into easy to use sections that will help you plan your story so that when that blank page comes calling, you're ready to answer. And then afterwards, once it's written, we realized you need to plan how to let people read it. So we included a section relating to submissions. Each one is designed for one project, whether you want to write a book, a screenplay, a comic, or any other kind of story. We truly believe that when you use it, it will help you get to the main event, writing your story. So we hope this helps. We can't wait to read what you come up with. And remember, Every story starts with page one. Did you always want to be a writer? Yeah, I think it's probably safe to say that I did. It's certainly something that I think I, I can remember always having done. I think even, you know, when I was a kid, I used to write stories at home about like Harry Potter and James Bond and characters from Lord of the Rings because I'd just been to see those films and I was like eight or nine or something I wanted to make up my own little stories about them so yeah I'd certainly I'd write those kind of things at home and then yeah at school I mean I, I, I was never very good at very much at school to be honest I was rubbish at maths and I was really rubbish at science but in English whenever a kind of creative writing task came along to write a story or something like that I'd, I'd 
I sort of knew that was my thing, if you like. And I'd always put in like 10 times as much effort with that as I would for anything else at school. Um, So yeah, I can remember always, always doing it and always enjoying it and always feeling that it was, it was kind of something that I could do and that I was quite good at, but it probably took me a while to work out what kind of writing I wanted to do. So I mean, when I was, when I was younger, when I was a kid, when I was at school, it was always, I wanted to, I wanted to write books. I wanted to be an author. I wanted to write like really exciting books that people would just have a good time reading and then when I was a teenager um, I started playing in a band and that kind of became the dream for a little while so I was writing music with those two guys right right writing loads of music all the time and uh, there's probably a period of a few years when I'd have really liked that to have taken yeah. off and yeah. to have been the thing that I did and and then I went to uni and I did English language and by the time I was coming to the end of that degree, I was trying to think about how I could I could make a, a living from writing, you know, what sort of jobs there were in the world of business that that I could do that would let me write every day and, and you know, make a living off it. And I, I decided to apply for um, a job at a PR agency and I, I worked for PR agencies for about eight years now. Um, and that, you know, that, that, that did the trick. I mean, I've been writing, you know, writing copy every day mm-hmm. for for websites and social media and for you know media relations like press releases and that sort of stuff and blogs for people and comments for clients that have appeared in in all sorts of different newspapers so so that's been exciting but yeah I think mean, I sort of probably three or four years into into doing that I came back around to the idea of of having a go at writing a novel and and seeing if if I could do it and <laughs> seeing if I could make anything of it um and uh, and yeah, that seems to be going quite well so far. Yeah, yeah, I think it's fair to say, but we'll definitely get onto that shortly. But actually, I just wanted to ask you about that, that the sort of PR writing and the copywriting and stuff. You know, yeah. a, a lot of um, writers, myself included, will are sort of attracted to the idea of doing a job that involves writing in some way, even if it's not fiction writing, not the type of writing they want to do. But it can be a kind of double-edged sword that I, I personally find anyway, in the sense that, you're, yes, you are writing, but you're you're using a lot of your writing ability or or you know um battery if you like on that type of writing and then it, it's harder sometimes to get get into the writing you actually want to do at the end of the day yeah you're right i think double-edged sword is a good way to describe it because there are definitely days when you come home having just you know written two thousand words at work mm-hmm. of you know stuff for various clients and and the thought of sitting down and opening your laptop at home and then writing 2000 words of a novel sometimes yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's just what you need sometimes you think oh great i've written 2000 words of of really boring stuff today and uh, you know the idea of writing an exciting murder mystery it, it gets you excited but then sometimes you get home and the thought of opening the laptop and spending your evening writing as well it just fills you with dread but i mean i <laughs> but i found um it does help you as well. So I, you know, over these eight years, I've learned how to edit my own work, which, yeah. which is really tough. Like, you know, getting to the end of something that you've, you know, if it's like an article or a piece of web copy that I've written at work and you know, I've just written this thousand word thing, getting to the end of that and looking at it and going, right, what's wrong with this? Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a really horrible thing to have to do, but you've got to do it when you're writing a novel as well, you know, just on a, on a much big, bigger scale. So, you know, learning to edit my own work and as well take feedback. You know, like I, yeah. everything I write in a PR agency has to be submitted to, you know, a manager in the agency and then to a client and there'll always be feedback and things that need changing or that they just don't like. And, you know, I've had eight years of learning how to take that constructively and knowing what is fair and what I want to yeah. push back on. And that's yeah. that's a, a skill that I think needs to be honed. Um, and as well, knowing, this is going to sound weird, but knowing how long it takes to write something. Yeah. So like, I, I know now in my head what a thousand words looks like on a page. Like yeah. I can I can look at a piece of writing and go, that's probably about 500 words. I just, I, I kind of know how that looks and I know how long it's going to take me to write a thousand words and it helps me to be quite structured in it. So if I set myself a target of, okay, I'm going to write a thousand words tonight. I, I know roughly how much of my story I'm going to get from that thousand words. And I know how many hours it's going to take me to do that. And, and that helps to structure it. So yeah, definitely a double-edged sword in that it's tough. I mean, I think it's probably tough with any day job trying to fit writing around it, but yeah, when you're, when you're writing for a living, then getting home and trying to do even more writing sometimes can be tough, but yeah, it's definitely, 
helped me as well to to hone some skills that I found useful while writing my books. Yeah. yeah. Now, A Fader Crossing was that's your debut novel, and we'll chat with that shortly. But I read in an interview that you you started working on it when you were still in school, and you began writing as a play um, to perform with 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 friends. And I wondered why did you go down the play route, not the novel route, to start with. Um, I think probably a few reasons. Firstly, I wanted to write something that I could do with my friends. So I loved the idea of, you know, I had a couple of pals in, in sixth form who were who were big into drama and and writing as well. And the idea of coming up with something that that wasn't just mine and that we could all come together and like perform, maybe even for an audience, you know, that was that just sounded like a lot of fun. But as well, I think part of the appeal of doing a fatal crossing as a play was that um, I thought, I mean, I'm probably very wrong about this, but I thought it'd be really easy to stage because <laughs> the cruise ship you need, I, well, I just thought if I can create like a cabin, which, you know, can double up as three or four different characters, yeah, uh-huh. cabins, maybe yeah. a deck, which can double up as three or four different decks on different parts of the ship. And then maybe a restaurant or something. Then yeah. I thought that's all I need to create in terms of a stage. And then you're sort of set. You can just, manage your play around that so I thought it'd be really easy to stage and the more I've thought about it since then because that was yeah that's, I mean I'm 29 now and that was I was about 16 17 when I was trying to do that so over the past 12 years I've thought about it a bit more and I think actually it'd probably be very <laughs> difficult to recreate a 1920s <laughs> cruise liner on a stage but yeah that was one of the reasons I thought it'd be good to do as a play okay. so so when when you when you decided to get back and to try to write a novel and um what was it a fatal crossing that you decided to revisit at that point yes it was um i mean the i guess the timeline of a fatal crossing was yeah so i was 16 17 i was in sixth form and um tried to write it as a play and essentially drastically underestimated how much work it would take to write a play because i wrote half of it and then we all finished sixth form and went to university (laughs) so so yeah i i hadn't yet worked out at that point how long it'd actually take me to write a play um and then i think I, i tried to write a little bit more of it at university but you know as it does being a student kind of got in the way and I was having too much fun doing lots of other things and I didn't finish it then either and then it kind of just went and it, it lived on a memory stick for a few years and I I never quite forgot about it it was always at the back of my mind but I was busy I say applying for jobs and you know moving down south and you know because I'm from Leeds originally I live down in Oxfordshire now um, and yeah life again just kind of got in the way a little yeah. bit then I was I was 20, 24, I think. And for Christmas, I was given Magpie Murders by Anthony Horowitz, which mm-hmm. is just an amazing book. And I love it so much. Um, and I was reading that. And folks who haven't read it, it's a book of two halves. And the first half is this very Agatha Christie-esque Midsummer Murders kind of um, murder mystery that's set in a little country village. And I, I, I'll be honest, I hadn't read much Agatha Christie at that point. I've read a couple, but I came to Agatha Christie quite late. Like most of the Agatha Christie that I've read has actually been in the last sort of four or five years or so. Right. So I was I was relatively new to this sort of genre. Um, and I read it and it just got me thinking again about A Fatal Crossing and thinking with, with some adjustments, um, this is what the story could be. You know, because the play was going to be... Well, first and foremost, the play was going to be a comedy, um, which was a, a very bad decision. I've still got some pages from the script somewhere, and it's it's not at all funny. It's, <laughs> it's actually really quite bad. Um, but it was going to be a comedy, and it was also going to be more of like a caper. So there are two yeah. there are yeah. two like strands in the book. So there's there's a missing painting, and there's the murder of of a passenger, and they do come together. But um, yeah, when I first came up with the play. I was much more interested in in the missing painting and the kind of search to get it back. And I think the play was going to end with it being rolled up inside an umbrella somewhere or something ridiculous like that. So that was kind of the vibe of the play. I remember reading, you know, Magpie Murders and just thinking, okay, so if I try this as a novel instead of a play, and if I make it much more of a a murder mystery rather than a a kind of a caper to try and get this stolen painting back, um, then it it could work in that form. And Mm. I had to go and I spent, six months kind of researching and plotting the story and working out how I was going to kind of approach it. And then after that, I spent 18 months working on my first draft around my day job. Um, and, and yeah, I think it, it turned out, it certainly turned out a lot better than the play. So, so I'm quite <laughs> pleased with it. <laughs> and when you're writing something like this, what's your style? I mean, imagine, you know, we often ask people, are you a planner or a pantser? And imagine for a novel like this, you're very much in the planning camp. Yeah, I, I try really hard to plan. Um, 
so I, I I've been that way with my first two, so Fatal Crossing and the Murder Game, and I'm I'm mm-hmm. I'm kind of really stuck into my third one now, and I've tried on all three really hard to to plan in as much detail as I can, but I end up pantsing it a little bit. I mean, I, <laughs> certainly on on you know the first two, I've ended up doing that. I'm not quite far enough into the third one yet to have to panic and start pantsing towards the end, but um, yeah, I think what I find is with both of them actually the Fatal Crossing and the murder game, I found that for all of my planning, there's always something that doesn't quite work in prose as it does just as a bullet point or a thought, or, yeah. you know, yeah. there'll be a plot detail that I haven't thought of, or there'll be a pacing issue like, okay, this, this story beat works fine here in a list of bullet points, but in the context of a novel, like as prose, it's just happening too quickly or it's happening too slowly. Or, you know, as I say, there'll be something I'd, I'd forgotten or I'd overlooked and I need to, adjust it slightly and they always end up um in both cases the fatal crossing and the murder game they've ended up in pretty much the same place uh well they've ended up pretty much where i meant them to but they end up getting there in a slightly different way to how i planned it if that makes sense so i try very hard to plan but i do in both cases so far i've ended up pantsing it a little bit but the the i suppose the the advantage of that i mean everyone must do that no one will plan out everything to the yeah. maybe some people do but no one we've spoken to has planned it to the nth degree there is there is that it's almost like when you plan something out you have it kind of gives you the confidence to then explore the story yourself and that's where the pantsing can can sort of come in and as you say as you're writing it obviously certain things will change and and because you've got the plan there in the background it can sometimes uh you know, it, it can give you the confidence to go and explore that path, I guess. Yeah. It's a very nice way of looking at it, and it makes me feel a lot better <laughs> without <laughs> having to, to give up on my plan a little bit. Yeah, I like that. You, you had mentioned earlier on with your with your day job as well uh, that one of the advantages of that is that you've learned how to edit your own writing and things like that. So, I mean, what is your process for that? Do you try and get to the end of the, the first draft um, without revising a lot or are you someone that revises as you go um i so i try and treat my first draft the whole thing as one big glorified plan essentially right, so okay. I'll, I'll come up with like my my plan and then i'll write my first draft and then i'll go back to the beginning of that first draft and the second draft is really just about looking at it and going what's wrong with it not what what's not working what needs changing um i'm very much a believer in the idea that the first draft is just about getting something down on paper to work with and the second draft is when you make it readable and the third draft is when you make it good <laughs> so that's that's kind of that's kind of how i work so i get to the end of each draft and i go back to the beginning and i just i don't quite rip it up but i really do lay into it like i, I just think if you're going to do it properly there's no point holding back you know if yeah. if you feel something isn't quite right then your reader is going to notice that too yeah. and the risk you run there i suppose is they put down the book because it's not working for them or yeah so i the editing stage is i think where the good stuff happens and i i really do try to to go for it and if something isn't right then then yeah it's it's got to change so yeah there's no point holding back when it comes to editing that is my my view and so so you've 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 done your editing process you've, you've done your three drafts and your book is perfect what was your point what was your, what was your what, what was your path there you know did you find an agent via the kind of traditional route of sending out sample chapters and synopsis yeah i mean i um so i found my agent in a way via twitter actually so okay. um again the day job helps with this so i mean for folks who might not know a big part of working in a pr agency is trying to send um stories out to journalists you know stories about things that you're your clients might be doing or might be announcing or whatever and your job is to kind of work out which journalists are going to be interested in this story and to present it to them in such a way that um that they might be they might be interested in and they might run that story in the newspaper or on their website or wherever um and journalists depending on where they're they're where they're writing they might get like 100 pitches a day um and so the competition's tight and that in a way felt very similar to pitching a book to an agent. So, um, I, you know, I mentioned earlier, one of the first things I did, well, one of the ways I went about writing a fatal crossing was I spent six months doing a load of research and then I started writing. Funnily enough, towards the end of that six months, I was at a, 
a festival um, in Oxfordshire called Wilderness Festival. It was a cool festival, actually. But they have a, a literature tent, and I saw that uh, they had a talk on one of the days I was there about how to get an agent. And I knew this was something I would need to do if I managed to finish, you know, if I managed to get a complete draft of the book. So I went along to hear what this agent had to say and what her her day to day was like. And that was really, really helpful. So I mean, even before I started writing then, I, I had this idea of of what she's looking for and what she likes and what she doesn't and what a good pitch looks like and what a bad pitch looks like. So okay. all the while while I was writing um, you know, the 18 months it took me to write that first draft, I was thinking as well about my strategy for for pitching to agents. And I um, I well, the first thing I did was I came up with a, a sort of a short list of 10 agents I really wanted to work with. And I did quite a lot of research to put that list together. So I, I looked for agents who were writing or who were representing similar writers or writers writing in similar genres. Um, I found a lot of them on Twitter and I started following them on Twitter, mostly to see if they tweeted, because something journalists will do in my day job is they will tweet about things that PRs have done that annoy them, <laughs> which right, okay. is kind of horrible if um, <laughs> if it's if it's you that they're tweeting about, which has only happened to me once and it really is quite soul destroying. <laughs> but it's really useful when it's not you because you can look at that and think, oh, great, I'm, I'm not going to do that when I pitch to a journalist. And I was hoping that literary agents might do the same thing and I could pick up some tricks from my own my own pitches so that's why I followed a load of them on Twitter um, and then I wrote kind of personalized letters for all 10 of them you know explaining why I wanted to work with them and and how much I admired the authors that they worked with and how I thought that my book might be a good fit and then we were getting on so this was over Christmas so I finished the book in November and I spent Christmas kind of the Christmas holiday period writing these letters and I decided I was going to send these letters out on the first Wednesday we got back to work after mm -hmm. the new year I wasn't going to do it on the Monday because I think the Monday was a bank holiday and I wasn't going to do it on the Tuesday because I thought their inboxes will be full and they'll be in meetings catching up and if I send a pitch on a Tuesday it's just going to get ignored so I'm going to wait like till the Wednesday I think like this you put a lot of thought into this well, as I say, this is how I think when I'm at work and I'm trying to pitch a story to a journalist, you know, these are the kind of thoughts we're having all the time. So it just felt, it felt very familiar trying to come up with this kind of strategy. Yeah. Um, so that was my plan. And then, so I was going to pitch on the Wednesday and then the weekend before, um, at about 10 o'clock on Saturday night, I was just scrolling through Twitter and one of the agents, the 10 agents I'd shortlisted, um, a guy called Harry, he tweeted saying, right, authors, my submissions are open. I, I'm open to submissions. Here's what I'm looking for this year. And so I sent him his letter and his, you know, um, his opening three chapters right then at 10 o'clock on the Saturday night. And I replied as well to his tweet saying, just sent you something I hope you like. Um, Murder mystery on a 1920s cruise liner, missing painting, suspicious death, dodgy detective. Hope you like it. And I got all that into, into one tweet and I replied to him. Um, I didn't think anything more of it, actually. I thought he's probably, you know, it's, it's Saturday night. He's not going to look did, at did it. Did he you like know, the tweet he... or anything like that? He did like the tweet and it gets better than that. When I went to bed at about midnight, I looked at my emails just out of habit and um, I had a request for the full manuscript. Oh, oh wow. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. So, so I kind of found him via Twitter and then I, I sent it to him then, of course, at midnight on Saturday and um I didn't I didn't hear anything back for for nearly two weeks and I was checking my my phone by like, every 20 minutes of course for yeah. those two weeks hoping there might be a reply um I was kind of starting to lose hope a little bit because I I say I've been to this this session with this agent on how to pitch and I knew from her how competitive it was going to be so I thought ah, it probably it's nearly two weeks it probably wasn't for him and then I was at work I was in the office and my, I saw my phone ringing and it was a London number and it wasn't a number I recognized. And I thought, oh, maybe, probably not, but maybe. Um, <laughs> and it was. And yeah, he, you know, he picks up the phone and he says, it's, you know, it's Harry from, from DHH. And, you know, I say to him, oh, hi, Harry, you know, trying to play it really cool. And in my head, I'm going, oh, my <laughs> God, <laughs> this is the best thing ever. Um, and yeah, so he said, you know, really like the book. Let's let's meet up and let's let's talk about um, me representing you and, and that was how it went so yeah Brilliant. for me it happened in a way it happened via twitter it's how i like to, to sort of tell the story excellent and and then obviously a fatal crossing uh, then the, did it sell quite quickly to to publishers so we had so that was in the january um and we had a few months of of editing it so we i went through a few rounds of edits with harry just getting it 
as good as it can be. Um, and then I think he sends it out. I think we were ready to go with it in either June or July. And he recommended sitting on it for you know maybe a month or so because he just said all the editors are going to be on holiday, essentially. So let's just wait until you know, nearer the end of the summer. So we did that. And then it went out at some point towards the end of August. I think by, it, I'm trying to remember, it was about two years ago now, about September, October time, we we had an offer in for it. Um, and, you know, we, we ultimately, well, we had a couple of offers in for it, but that first offer came in and yeah, it's the one we, we ended up going with. So it was probably about eight or nine months between signing with Harry and then the book actually selling. Brilliant. And it's, it's funny because I think, you know, recently the last few years, we've really seen a resurgence of this type of story. You know, this kind of yeah. like locked room, multiple suspects type yeah. of tale, both in books and films like Knives Out and the Poirot films are kind of come back a little bit with Brana. You know, what's what's your thoughts? Why do you think everyone's loving this kind of genre again? I think, so what I have found interesting writing in this genre myself is that as I say I, I came to Agatha Christie a little bit late so I, I sort of started properly properly reading Agatha Christie when I decided I was going to have a go at Fatal Crossing and I thought I need to read you know some of the books written by the master I suppose um, and what I find interesting about that was looking back now a lot of the stuff that I the stories I loved growing up um, and that have been incredibly popular are themselves murder mysteries or kind of whodunits mm -hmm. so i mean when i was a kid my favorite show on tv was scooby-doo and I, you know i didn't think about it at the time and it's fine it's not a murder mystery nobody's killed it's more who's dressing up as a monster to keep yeah but it's very similar kind of idea isn't it that kind of exactly every episode is a perfectly formed 20 minute murder mystery yeah. um and then you know, if you think about the Harry Potter books as well, I was a huge, huge Harry Potter fan growing up because that was just, it was all happening while I was i was a kid and I was a teenager. But the first three, three or four Harry Potter books, again, perfectly good whodunits. You know, you have a question like who, I don't know, who's opened the Chamber of Secrets and you have suspects and you have clues and you have a big reveal at the end. And I, I think this stuff has, has kind of always been there kind of hiding if you like yeah. um perhaps because I, I i never took this until i was you know reading anchor for christie i was like oh my god this is where all this stuff i've loved all my life has come from um yeah. but i think in all honesty i don't quite know where the resurgence in kind of very straight this is a murder mystery and that's what it is that sort of genre has come from but i, I can tell you what i think people love about it and certainly say what i think i love about mm -hmm. it i i love the feeling of playing a game with with the author you know for me when i'm reading a murder mystery i'm looking out for clues i'm listening to what the all the different suspects are saying and i'm trying to guess the killer before yeah. the end and yeah, yeah. um it's I, I can't think of many other genres that really do that in quite the same way and i think that is that's what we love about them and i think when it comes to the big reveal if if it's pulled off well and that big twist it makes sense and you didn't see it coming and it is you know mm -hmm. it's it is really satisfying I again, I can't think of many other genres that can provide that level of satisfaction that yeah. you get from from that reveal yeah. and having yeah. having the wall pulled over your eyes and the rug pulled from under your feet. I think um, I I think that's what people love about it. I think I don't know. I mean, I don't know how many people share this view, but I I kind of struggle a bit with um, sort of gorier crime, like you know. Like serial killers and that kind of thing i think and yeah. police procedurals sometimes too i think what's nice about a whodunit is that it's it's just it's fun um and yeah. it's fun murder it's it's kind of fun murder <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah exactly as i say it's that feeling of playing of playing a game with the author or yeah. as the author now playing a game with the reader which which yeah. is really nice yeah. but what i like about this genre is that it's a murder mystery but it's more about the mystery than the murder you know yeah. it's not mm -hmm. about the blood and the gore and mm -hmm. about loads of graphic descriptions of really horrible crime scenes it's about the drama between the characters it's about who's keeping secrets from who who's lying about what and it's um i i think that's what people find so engrossing about it is it's more about it's more about the human interest factor than it is about blood and gore and i think that's what makes it interesting and what makes it so fun and that's that that brings me to my next question which is when you're coming up with these books with these stories obviously the characters in these stories are key that as you as you just said that that's the fun is 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 
building up these suspects and as the reader trying to say, oh, they've got motive, oh, what, what about that? Well, that seems dodgy, etc. Do you, do you, what, what comes first? Is it, is it the idea for the twist? Is it the characters or does it vary from book to book? Um, well, I mean, I need to know who the murderer is from the off. I can't, I've, I can't write one of these things without knowing who the killer is and where they're hiding. And, and, and I need, I mean, I've heard a few people say that they, they just completely pants it from yeah. the off when they're mm-hmm. writing a murder mystery and even they don't know who the killer is until they get there. And I, I, I got so much respect for that approach because I have absolutely no idea how to do it. Like I, I need to know who the murderer is um, if I'm going to write a murder mystery, but um, yeah, I think, so I, I generally, I generally, I start with an idea. So with Fatal Crossing, it's the idea of what if uh, someone was murdered and a painting was stolen on a cruise liner, and then I work backwards from there. So I think, well, what kind of characters do I need to have in play for this scenario to exist? So you know, who is the murdered passenger? Why is this painting on a ship? Mm-hmm. Who's taking it? You know, who's taking this painting on a ship? Where are they going? Why do they have the painting? What are they going to do with it? What kind of person? needs to um be in this story for for that scenario to happen and then you kind of work backwards from there and then once i've got an idea of who the victim is perhaps i can then work around that and just think okay well what sort of people would this individual have in their life you know family members friends colleagues you know acquaintances enemies you know who what sort of characters might surround this person and then your your cast is kind of starting to come together if you like and then from there you think well what what sources of tension might there be between each of these characters what kind of disputes might exist and um yeah you kind of work backwards from there so that's that is how i tend to work so i start with that that idea that kind of what if and then it's all about or what sort of circumstances and what sort of characters need to exist for this what if scenario to yeah. to exist and from there it's all about it's all about the conflicts between between the characters you know it's like we were saying a minute ago what i think is interesting about who done it is that human interest factor yeah. it's the grudges it's the lies it's the secrets and i think once you have your your kind of casting characters cast of characters in place that is when you can start to to weave in that conflict and and work out what the what the kind of the juiciest driving parts of the story are going to be so yeah i mean it's i say i know it's not how everyone does it you know i'm very aware some people do just start writing and just see where it goes and see who the murderer ends up being but yeah for me it's i kind of got to start with the what if and then i start with the end and and then i I reverse engineer it a little bit where where do you stand on on uh, the old red herrings thing because we had we had stuart turton on who obviously Mm. um works in the same uh, genre um you know albeit in different different types of setting really but um he, and he 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 hated red herrings he he doesn't like them he said he, he thinks they're they're a red herring in themselves i suppose i mean what, where do you stand on that i think um i think everything has to ultimately contribute to your big reveal so i think if a red herring is literally just to kind of keep the story warm or to add yeah. like an extra 5,000 words to your story so that, you know, you make up your word count and it's, and it's long enough to be a book, then yeah, that's, that's a waste of time. But if you're, if by kind of following a red herring and, and learning that you've been deceived or whatever, you learn something that will ultimately help you identify the murderer yeah. in, you know, yeah. in the case yeah. of, a, of a whodunit, then, and it does contribute to our story in that way, then I think it's, I think it's okay. Um, what I find, I mean, the, the red herrings I, I kind of like are the ones where I think I've got it cracked and then it turns out that was just a yeah. red herring. So I, I read Death in the Clouds earlier this year, which is, um, it's an Agatha Christie, it's a Poirot novel and it's set on a plane and essentially it's a little plane, there's only like eight, maybe ten people on it and someone is murdered on this plane right in front of Poirot's nose and I was convinced I knew who'd done it um, and like I'd, you know, I'd seen um, I'd seen this particular item that I was sure was the murder weapon and I was like, right, okay that's clever but I've got you, I, I, I know I, this is going to be it. And I remember saying to my wife, I was like, Do you know what? For the first time, I think I might actually <laughs> have worked this out. Um, and I hadn't. It was a red herring. But that that didn't irritate me too much because yeah. I thought, oh, actually, while she's 
distracted me with this red herring, all of the details um, that actually do reveal the murder were under my nose at the same time. And I ignored them because I thought, no, 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 I'm not paying attention to that. I'm paying attention mm-hmm. to, to, what, to what I think, you know, to my theory. So that was, that was kind of okay because I thought, oh, well... I guess you've played fair there and that's just me being a bit, it, it goes yeah. back to what you were saying about the sort of game between the author and the reader there I guess. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Um so I mean there's I mean there's I think there's fun to be had in identifying the red herrings just in the same way as trying to identify the actual real clues if you like. So but yeah but I think it's it's like anything in a story it has to it can't just be there just for the sake of being there it yeah. has to yeah. contribute yeah. to your overarching story and it has to play a role in some way and i mean you know books like these and and, and stories like the, like these they've got their kind of their, their strict rules that that they have to ad- adhere to and things that people maybe expect to to have in a story like this and and, and beats and cliches perhaps but but that's kind of part of the fun but and is that something that you quite enjoy having these kind of this kind of template to follow or is it is it also quite fun to subvert that and to break the rules a little bit and, and to know what you can and can't break um i yeah it's an interesting question i think it's it is fun subverting the rules so i i don't want to say too much about my third book because the second one hasn't even come out yet but i'm 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 a good way into my third one and i'm having some real fun with subverting the kind of the rules of time a little bit so okay. i don't know i'm describing it as kind of christopher nolaning it a bit in my head right. so i'm kind of jumping back and forward a little bit okay, between nice. yeah. what yeah um and I'm, I'm having fun with that and just seeing can i still hit the the beats that i need to um for a traditional murder mystery while hopping back and forward between these two different timelines which which is which is proving fun but yeah it was interesting like i mean one of the things i did when i decided i was gonna have a proper go at writing this book was i i went out and picked out i picked up a load of different murder mysteries by a load of different authors and my my plan there was just read them all and see what beats um they all they all hit and where Mm. they all had or where they all saw a bit of room to add some creative license and do their own thing. And that was a really interesting exercise. So I definitely um, I definitely picked up on some beats that they do all hit and that I, I therefore try to make sure I hit, but seeing where they all had, uh, or they all kind of left their own mark on it, and that gave me confidence to think, okay, there is plenty of room for me to yeah. do my own thing mm-hmm. here too. So um yeah, I do. I do like looking for ways to to mix it up and and to do to keep things fresh and do things a little differently for sure. And uh, we, we've we've talked around it, but obviously uh, you do have your your second of which I've got here, the the murdered game, mm. uh, cu- coming out um, uh, ne- early next year. Uh, is that February? Right? Yeah, yeah, February. February. Um, do you, do you want to tell us a little bit about what that one's about? Yeah, sure. So, um, so the murder game, uh, as you might have guessed, it's another who done it. Um, it's a contemporary novel, so it's set um, it's set in a hotel in a remote part of Devon, as opposed to a nineteen twenties cruise liner. Um, the whole thing takes place in one night, um, and the idea is that there is a a murder mystery party happening in this hotel, and um, there is an actual there's a real murder that takes place midway through this party. So there are clues all around the hotel and there are actors playing characters and these guests have all gathered to celebrate New Year's Eve um, and to play this game and to have to have a lovely time. And then midway through the game, um, there's, a, there's quite a controversial figure. So we are we set it in a, a village that I've made up. It's called Hamlet Wick. And there's quite a controversial guy in Hamlet Wick called Damien White. And he turns up out of nowhere to join this party. Um, no one was expecting him. Everyone's surprised to see him. Um, but he's come to join, to join the murder mystery game. And then very quickly after he started, he himself is found actually dead. And suddenly all of the clues that have been planted um, by the guy who set the party up are now pointing in his direction um but they are implicating now him now in the real murder of damian white so there's quite a bit going on in terms of like murder mysteries within murder mysteries yeah. um but it's it's been a lot of fun to write and you know writing it setting the whole thing in one night was was a really interesting challenge trying to keep that pace going and yeah. well i mean just pacing in general you know it's trying to make sure it's not all over too quickly but 
um, that it actually happens at a decent speed. I've, I really enjoyed trying to trying to make that work. But yeah, I'm very proud of it. So as you say, that's out in February and I'm really hoping people enjoy it in the same way they seem to have enjoyed A Fatal Crossing. Is it is it hard to come up with ideas for more stories in this kind of universe or is it is the does the kind of format almost help with that you know if you if you all you need is as you kind of say when you came up with the idea for the for your, for your first book would you kind of have this kernel of an idea and then you can aspire a lot backwards from that is that quite a kind of creatively freeing process and it helps with writing idea coming up with ideas yeah i guess it is it's um i mean there are definitely a lot of ideas that get thrown out um, I mean, I've, I've developed a habit recently, which my, my wife really dislikes, which is whenever we're kind of anywhere interesting, I sort of wonder to myself, oh, I wonder what would be happening. I wonder what it'd be like if someone was murdered here. What would, <laughs> <laughs> what would, what would that, what would the story behind that be? Um, so yeah, I, quite often I have ideas of, oh, what if a murder happens in this interesting place for this reason? And, um, I'll mull it over for a few days and I'll decide actually, it's already been done or there's not enough there really or you know I, I don't quite know how to approach it and so the idea gets thrown out so I think settling on the idea that I'm going to go with next is um is probably the trickiest part of that but I the way I I ultimately decide what I'm going to do is I think if well I, I try and poke holes in an idea so if I can stress test it and look for plot holes and try and essentially pull it apart and it it stands up to that process and after I've spent a few weeks trying to trying to see what's wrong with it it's still standing then that that's an idea that I'll usually progress um, but also if an idea stays with me for a good few months then I know there's something there like an idea that yeah. that isn't going to make the cut it won't stay in my head I'll, I'll just forget about it after a few weeks and then I might remember it in a year's time and go oh yeah I had an idea about that and then I forgot about it so it probably mm -hmm. wasn't you know it probably wasn't actually that exciting but yeah it's um there are always kind of ideas of oh what about a murder in this place or you know in this time period or in this crazy setting um and it's just about sifting through those and trying to work out which ones are worth investing a year of your life into trying to yeah. turn turn into a book well I was going I was going to ask about that in terms of obviously the first book you you have as long as you want to write it and then mm -hmm. Um, after that, uh, you're you're on contract. You've got deadlines, etc. How, how has that been for you? Has it been, has it helped in a way to have a deadline, or is it is it difficult sometimes? Yeah, I I, I think it does help. I mean, there is. <laughs> I, when you're writing that first one and there's no agent waiting for it, no publisher, and you don't know if anyone's going to ultimately read it, you know, you you it's it, sometimes it's really hard to muster up the motivation to sit down and spend your evening or your weekend or whatever it is working on that book so it's nice not to have that and to know that there is someone waiting to read this book when you finish it um the the pre i mean there's definitely more pressure as you say um there is sometimes a deadline to deal with but i mean what i've found from this experience over the past couple of years with both of these books is you don't remember you don't remember those awful weekends when you're up at sort of one in the morning on a Saturday trying desperately to finish your edits. What you remember instead is um, a really lovely review or seeing a poster for your book somewhere or seeing it yeah. in the window of a shop. So yeah, it does, it can be difficult and there is pressure and there are definitely times when you find yourself questioning your life choices. But um, I find that only, only lasts for the moment you're in it once you're kind of through it and you've you've sent that draft back then i mean i i personally just go back to enjoying it all and just being very grateful um but yeah you do definitely have moments where it's like why am i doing this to myself <laughs> right so a fatal crossing is out now and we have the murder game coming out february next year um and you've kind of touched base on a little bit on book three that you're working on but what's what's next is that is that next is that the next big thing or have you got other stuff in the pipeline yeah so book three is is the next big thing so i'm trying to have a draft of that done for april um that's that's the plan um i think that will be out at some point in 2024 so yeah it's still it again it's another strange change to my strange change to my day job is I'm used to kind of turning stories around in a day in the agency whereas out here it's I'm working on something that's not going to be published yeah. for two years um but yeah that's that's the next thing and then 
after that, um, I'm not sure. I mean, I've got plenty of other ideas. I think I know already what I'd like to do for my fourth book and maybe even my fifth. Um, so I'll, I'll get cracking straight on with those in April um, once I've finished my draft of book three. But um, I've got other things I'd like to do too. I'd, I've got an idea for a play that I'd, I'd really, really like to like. Uh, like to like, I'd really like to write. Um, and yeah, I've, I've got lots of things I'd like to do. But yeah, so so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be busy. Excellent. Nice. You may you may you may get to make those sets or see those sets. For <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> What was the last book that you read? So I am um, the last book I finished was The Twist of a Knife by Anthony Horowitz. It's the latest in his mm. his Hawthorne series, which I've absolutely loved. And I'm currently halfway through um The Whistling by Rebecca Netley, which is um it's a ghost story. Like I I, I really love a good ghost story. Um and this is of course, you know, a few days out from Halloween, the best time of best time of the year to read one. I'm having a, a fantastic time with that. It's incredibly creepy and very mysterious, and I'm I'm enjoying that an awful lot. Excellent. Nice. Um, what about the last film that you watched? The last film I watched was uh, a few nights ago. I watched Top Gun Maverick for the third oh. time. <laughs> oh, yeah, I've still so not good. seen it yet. I've oh, have you not seen it yet? No, oh, man, it's it. awesome. Mark, you could get on it. I was, I was fine. Genuinely, I had like tears in my eyes at the end. I just couldn't believe quite. I mean, we could spend a whole podcast talking about Top Gun Maverick. Like, I just, I, I cannot believe how good that film was. Like the first yeah. one, I, I was never that fussed about the first one. No, I, I, no, I'm the same. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's and funny. then I heard they were making this one, and I thought, just a bit of a cash grab, really, isn't it? And then a lot of film journalists that I, I have a lot of time for all came out giving it five star reviews, and I thought maybe there's something here. And then I went to the cinema with a few of my mates, and we were all kind of interested but a bit skeptical and the lights came up at the end and we all just turned each to each other and just said oh my god that was so incredibly good so very yeah. much like a like an 80s movie but modernized that it still has that exact same opening sequence like cheesy music and stuff but doesn't but does it but feels modern in, in a strange way yeah. it leans into the cheese and i've got a lot of respect for it for that like it knows what it is and it is so unapologetic yeah. and um yeah i just so yeah that was the last film i watched anyway i watched that on friday night for for the third time this year nice. Nice. I'll, I'll need to i'll need to get watched um wh what about uh the last tv show that you watched or are watching at the moment uh, I, like I'm sure a great many other people did a couple of nights, I watched the final episode of House of the Dragon, which again has just, I mean, I'm a, I'm a huge, huge Game of Thrones nerd. Like I've mm -hmm. read all the books and I, I spend more time than I care to admit watching kind of fan theories as to how the last <laughs> couple of books are going to end on YouTube. Um, and yeah, again, you know, they announced this. I thought, is this just a bit of a cash yeah. grab? And mm -hmm. it's ended up being the highlight of my week probably watching house of the dragon it's incredibly good so yeah that's the uh, the last thing i watched on tv yeah they, they really captured the, the sort of the base bits of what game of thrones is which is the sort of conniving backstabbing side, yeah. <laughs> side of things so yeah no it, it's been great uh, and then Tarek, the last thing yeah the very last thing we do is a super quick fire either or so um i would say there's no right answer here apart from one but we'll start off with agatha christie or anthony horowitz Oh, I think Horowitz. Nice. Uh, TV or cinema? Cinema. Night Owl or Early Bird? Early Bird. Uh, music or no music when you're writing? Uh, no music when I'm writing. I just can't. I can't write with music on. But like in every other element of my life, music all the time. Okay. Nice. And uh, real book or ebook? Real book. Oh, no hesitation. No, not even a, not even a <laughs> glimmer of hope for ebook in that one. I just, I like having something to hold, and yeah, I like having I something like to put it. on my shelf as well when I'm done. And yeah, it's, I'm, I'm yeah. sorry, I'm a bit of a dinosaur. <laughs> where, where, where do you stand on audiobooks? Which is what some people have been saying. Um, I, I enjoy audiobooks. Um, I can I mean, I, I, well, I don't so much since the pandemic but i used to spend a huge amount of time in the car like just driving to and from work like i'd be in the car for sort of two and a half hours every day so um i used to listen to an awful lot of audiobooks then but if it's something that i really really want to read then i i like to have the experience of you know so just holding a physical thing in my hands and and just going through it myself at my own pace and yeah so i i do enjoy audiobooks and um i have a lot of time for them but I say if it's something that I'm I've been looking forward to and I'm really eager to read I 
I'd like to read it myself. Okay, Tom, let me put this question to you. Audiobook or ebook? <laughs> <laughs> um Oh man. Okay, let's go, let's go audiobook. Oh come <laughs> on. <laughs> what's what's with the ebook love going oh, on here? Like just... are you just <laughs> Tarek, I mean, Tarek has, has created a character for himself where he has to be the ebook fan and no one says it's ebook. A very ever. small pool of people. I thought I was like, surely against audio. I'm going to have to explain it. I'm going to like, ebook or boot covered in shit. <laughs> yeah, one, ebook <laughs> or being murdered. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, ebook or death. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, thanks very much. Tom, that, that was a lot of fun. That was great fun, Tom. No, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. As I say, it's a great podcast, so I, I was really chuffed when you asked me, so thank you. So, uh, e-books losing out twice. It's not a good start of the year for you there. You this give is... them the chance to pick know, a real know, book and know, an but... audio book or an I've e-book, got really... and you chose the other two <laughs> twice. <laughs> I've got a really good feeling about 2023. I've honestly, I think 2023 is going to be the year of the ebooks. I've got, I can feel it. I've got a, it, there's something in, something in the winds changing. It, it, it's, it's ebooks time. It's finally coming out. It's going to, it's going to sort of slow and it's going to lull people into that false sense of security. And audiobooks going to be kind of laughing at source on the side, but, but give it to the end of the month. Give it you to reckon? February. This is the year back. of the guests and the yeah, ebooks. Yeah. yeah. This is it. Uh, well, uh, thanks very much to Tom for, for that chat. That was really interesting. And, you know, as we touched on at the start, a uh, big locked room murder mystery mm. writer, which have seemed to, uh, you know, we touched on it in the chat with him. It's, they seem to have sort of come back into fashion. I'm thinking yeah. of um, things like uh, Richard Osman's books, um, also films like the, you know, the Poirot films by Kenneth Branagh and... Uh, Obviously, the the um, Ryan Johnson Knives Out films yep. as well. Yep. The, it is interesting that it is a genre that has a sort of, this sort of enduring appeal, and it always amazes me that there is there are so many different know, variations. It of seems this like story it would be such a limited um, yeah. pool of story there because you've got like essentially it's the same mystery every time, right? You've got yeah. like a You've got a locked room. You've got a limited area. Yeah, whether it's a room or an island. Or yeah, something, exactly. But you've and you've got a, a small cast. People are trapped. Yeah, and exactly. someone's died, and someone's a baddie, and 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 I guess it shows you the, the the imagination that people bring to it because they're able to take that base starting that first act and then and spiral it out from there in a way that's you know you look at Knives Out and then you look at Poirot and they're very similar in a lot of ways, but they're also very 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 different. You know. I think what I loved about Knives Out was how was how modernized it was, and it took and it, and it played and it and it poked fun at the kind of genre, yeah. but without breaking the rules almost. And it is like Tom said, it's sort of that game between the reader and the author. And yes, you're, you know, it's partly as you read it, you're trying to work it out yourself. Um, yes. and and prove yourself to be clever uh, in that. So uh, yeah, I, I I do get the appeal, but yeah, like I say, it's it's amazing that the. There are so many fresh stories still to tell with this, but I suppose when you've got a, a cast of characters and any one of them could have done it, there's always a, a sort of infinite amount of possibilities to yeah. To tell and and I think it does play to that. People love these kind of hidden role games, you know, werewolf yeah. and stuff. There's there is that kind of thrill in someone here is lying and mm-hmm. you know and, and trying to work out who it is. And yeah, I, I think you're right. I think putting the reader or the viewer in, into the role of the of the cop or the or the problem solver is part of the fun of it for sure. Yeah, and and obviously, um, I, I said at the start that you know over Christmas many people will have watched Glass Onion, and so mm-hmm. um, I thought it would be fun to have a quick chat about that, a spoiler filled chat. So yes. we'll give away the ending uh, of the film. So if you haven't watched it, we are giving you ample warning that we're going to spoil <laughs> Glass Onion now. So I'll give you a minute to press stop. Okay. <laughs> go ahead. So, so you you've watched it, I know. Um, I've seen what, it. Yeah, yeah. What, what did you think of it? I I really liked it. I thought um it was it was different. I wasn't sure what to expect going into it. I felt it was different from the first one in a number of ways. It was much funnier, and I felt and and I can see why this would annoy some people. But I felt it, as we just said, it it didn't really give you the ability to solve it yourself because it kept information back from you. That it that it you know the fact that, that that the girl was her sister, 
or the fact that she hadn't been when she was shot she wasn't dead you know these were things that were kept from you and then it kind of flashed back and showed you them and i and i quite i liked that because i thought it was quite fun and i just kind of went along with it and it was quite interesting not being able to solve it but just seeing it on you know going along with with the story but i i do appreciate that for people who like trying to solve these things you couldn't do that and so that maybe that was a problem for some people well, I don't know. I think there was hints. You know, there was the very first scene with Janelle Monet's character, and she she was breaking into the box. There was a hint that she wasn't like yeah, the other that's ones. true. That's true. Um, yeah. And also the hint, you know, when she turns up and people don't expect her and all of this sort of stuff. Mm-hmm. It, there's there is some hints, but perhaps not enough. But actually, I think I slightly disagree because there's a scene in the film that I saw. Oh it, yes. A very, a, yes, and it kind of gives the whole thing away. And I was surprised actually that they left it in it in that way. So, the, and this is the massive spoiler of the film, but um, Ed Norton's character gives um, Dave Bautista's character a, a, a drink and then Dave Bautista dies. But yeah, in the scene, you actually see him hand the drink to him. Mm-hmm. I spotted it and I, I said it to my my family when I was watching it. Oh, I think it might be him. Uh, and it, But then they, they sort of replay the scene and they do it where you don't see that happening. Yeah. You think it's he's picked up the wrong glass, um, which I thought they would have put, you know, they would have obs- obfuscated that in a, in a more because if you spot that, then it kind of gives away the whole thing. Yeah, see, the, I didn't spot that. So I, that, I, I, I I missed that. And then when they played it back, the two different versions of, you know, either him passing the glass or him picking up yeah. the wrong glass himself, I was like, oh, I don't have a clue what what actually, yeah. what actually happened. And, and, and I, I actually assumed that it'd been impossible to to see it because as you say i feel if you if what if, if you do spot that you can't get past that fact that he's given you the yeah the ba- exactly like that he's a bad guy i suppose yeah so i mean i i really enjoyed it i thought it was brilliantly acted and it was funny as you say I, my only issue as well was that the ending i felt was a bit like they had written themselves into a corner and so they decided to blow everything up and literally i, I wasn't actually that convinced that smashing everything and doing all that would bring ed norton's character down in the way that the film was implying anyway it would it would obviously cost some money to have burnt the mona lisa and stuff like that but <laughs> but, um, but i suppose it was more as like his reputation yeah i suppose was, so, was yeah. ruined i suppose but um, but, um but yeah but no, no I did, it, I did it's like an it enjoyable lot. film but i i preferred the first one i think yeah i i, I the first one is much more it's a very it's a, it's a really really smartly written uh classic example of that genre i think and this one i think i was quite in a way i was quite glad it didn't repeat the first one and it went in a different route oh, a little yeah. bit uh-huh. um yeah but yeah I, I feel it's not as tight as the first one was although i did i did enjoy it for different reasons i think when when blank solves the murder mystery oh yeah like that was two that minutes was that was yeah. that was fantastic i laughed i never laughed so hard at a murder mystery thing forever no and like i say it was brilliantly acted the characters were brilliant so i absolutely want to see another one um oh yeah definitely uh, but yeah, it, it, I think in, in ranking order, I'd still put the first one ahead of ahead yeah. of that one. So it's it just great seeing enjoyable. Craig play a role that's quite fun and not yeah, just like exactly. super yeah. serious uh-huh. and you know dour. Absolutely. So um, that's the end of the the film review <laughs> section. <Yeah. laughs> but next week we have another brilliant guest on the podcast. Yeah, next week we're going to be chatting with Elle Connell, who uh, she is originally uh, known by her birth name of Lucy Ribchester and she began writing um, historical crime fiction uh, and then after under a while that she, name. under that name sorry yes and after a while she switched to a pseudonym L Connell and wrote more kind of modern day crime stuff so it's an interesting chat about using a pseudonym how you come up with that name two different personas and yeah that that whole thing of like being being able to write a different genre mm-hmm. uh, with a different name kind of a thing it's it's interesting whether you want to do that as an author do you want to try and build up your reputation i know i feel like you're starting from scratch again yeah exactly there is a bit there is an aspect of that but it does let you explore different types of stories totally totally so yeah no it's a really good chat so hope you can tune in for that one if you enjoyed today's episode please do take time to uh, rate and review us on your favorite podcast app that really helps us to continue to get great guests on the podcast and of course, if you want to get in touch with any questions or comments, you can always send us a tweet in the Twitter sphere, which is at UK page one, or send us an email, which is podcast at rightgear.co.uk. Or 
on Mastodon since Twitter continues to have its issues. Uh, we are at page one pod uh, on the writing dot exchange server. So the details are in the podcast description. I mean, Marco, it sounds like you have to be some kind of hacker to get into Mastodon, I'll be honest. It's actually not that complicated. <laughs> it's very similar to Twitter, which you're actually on there. Yeah, so thanks for tuning in and we hope to see you next episode. See you later. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please leave a comment down below. Hit that thumbs up button. Be sure to hit that subscribe button as well so you never miss an episode like that. And if you want to get in touch, you can always drop us a tweet in the Twitter machine, which is at UK page one, as evidenced here. And our other social media channels are available. Otherwise, we hope to see you next episode. See you later.